been with uh, the DOT for about 10 years now, and I've been with Bismarck District, I think, for about eight. And in the last two or three years, I've gotten more involved with the paving workbook, kind of uh, making changes to it and trying to improve it for everybody. So today I kind of want, I wanted to talk about I guess how to fill it out a little bit, uh, things to look out for, things you may not have uh, not have known it can do. Then I have uh, some new stuff I'd like to show as well. So uh, let me share my screen. Everybody, can you see it? Yes, Lauren. Okay. Um, <clears throat> when you uh, start your project, you're going to want to make a your first workbook and fill that out just kind of as, as little as possible to uh, be a template for all your future future lots. So um, you're going to start, you're going to have to uh, fill all this data in. I, I'm not going to type it in, it'll take forever. But so uh, one first place you'll look is your plans. So here you'll have your project number, PCN, governing specifications, county, project location, you know, that's all that's in the summary. You'd want to put that in and you've got further down. Here you could see your uh, spec number, FAA number, here we have FAA 42 and your uh, oil type. Um, you'll also need to look in your proposal for your uh, mixed cost per ton and your special provisions if you have any. So there's usually a bookmark for the index of provisions. I just scroll down until you see this page. You're gonna to wanna to be looking at these for a few in particular. Um, and this year we have um, got a few, got, uh, we might have some compaction adjustment factors. They're gonna, there will be some uh, percent within limits projects, SMA projects, and then super pay five. So if you see any of those on your proposal, be sure to uh, put that in there because that will change the workbook somewhat significantly. Um, you'll also need to look at your mix design. And here you have your pit owners, pit locations, uh, these uh, Blend percentages, asphalt content is down here. And you're gonna need to go a little bit further in. Pit locations again, asphalt specific gravity. It's one of the things in the summary. Brand of asphalt for su supplier of asphalt. And then also over here, we have some aggregate properties on the summary sheet. And you're gonna get this data in the mix design as well. Here you've got your aggregate types. Need your percent passing number four sieve, and you also need your bulk specific gravities. All that data and that is further down in the mix design. So a few other things you'll need: oil pounds per gallon. Those will, you'll get off the manifest. Uh, plant type: if it's a drum or batch plant, you'll just have to look at the plant. Then the uh, other things like contractor, engineer, QA, and QC testers and their IDs. Um, you might you have a QA, QC plan you can look at or ask the engineer. Um, and then pan, planned paving pass depth, um, that might, you might get that from the field, field inspector or from the engineer if they know. Um, all right, and then there's a few things that you should probably leave blank, like the date, <laughs> time start, time ended, and lot number just so when you're copying this to use as your subsequent lots, you don't have the wrong time in there. If you saw there's a time in there and it was you know, from the first day, you might not know to change it. Um, so why some of this information put in here? Um, <clears throat> materials and research for the, I think last two or three years as well has had a large spreadsheet with paving data for like every project they can put in there. And a lot of this data that's on the summary sheet is used and pulled into that main spreadsheet that they have. So then they can, you know, investigate certain things if we have an issue with, you know, 
paving on milled surfaces or something, they can pull in all the milled surface projects and just filter those out and look at, you know, look at what's going on with those. So, and then even stuff that they don't know that they want yet. And just having more information in here gets more information into their main spreadsheet. <clears throat> so uh, that's why it's uh, quite important to uh, keep this correct. So once the, uh, once the summary is filled out, you'll have to name your workbook. And here I have it labeled, you know, ND paving workbook. I have the date and lot number. Um, one thing you may also want to do is make it add a QA in there somewhere because Excel has an issue where you can't open two identically named Excel files at the same time. So if both you and the contractor are, you know, naming naming your workbooks the same, you might have some issues. Um, I think how I have the workbook currently, we avoid that with how I'm I'm opening them in a specific way, but uh, it, that could change at any point. I've I've noticed some other things changing with Excel that breaks how I've done other things. Um, I guess any questions so far? All right. Excuse me. Next, I want to talk about uh, importing QC data a little bit. I hope at this point, most contractors are also using the workbook. Um, if they're not, <clears throat> you're gonna have to spend a lot of time entering all that data yourself. And if they're using the workbook, it's a lot easier and faster to get everything imported. And here, I just wanted to show a couple different ways that you can do it and just how it how it affects your, how you're filling it in. So first, enable content. And in the quick links here, just click import QC lot. And in this example, I just have the contractor's QC workbook in just any named folder. So you can either click on the folder and click OK, or double click the folder to go inside and then click OK as well. And what the, what the function's looking for is on the QC workbook, it's looking for the PCN and lot number. And if, if it finds it in there, it pulls the data in. And in the second example, a little different, I have the folder named QC workbooks. So uh, when it's looking for the files, even before it opens that initial dialog box you saw in the last example, it's looking for a folder named QC workbooks. And if it finds the correct file in there, it will just pull it in. So I clicked import QC lot and the data is just coming in automatically. So there's less, less input for you, less, less time taken searching for things. And in the last example is like the worst case. In this case, they don't have, it's still in the QC workbooks folder, but this does not have the PCN data in it. I'll open our workbook. If I click import QC lot, it didn't find it in there. So it's trying to look for the folder, try it again, it still can't find it. So now we actually have to pick the file itself. Yeah, so it's just going to assume that you have the correct project and lot number. This time, select the file and click open, and it's just gonna pull it in. And I mean, if you if you pick a file that isn't a paving workbook doing that, it's probably going to fail and probably like you'll probably have to close Excel and open it up again. Um, okay. Um, so now, now you have that data data from the contractor in here, you've done your own tests. I just want to point out a, a few things with some of the other sheets to look out for. So I went to the compaction control sheets here. Um, you're going to want to make sure you have your stationing direction correct. And put in your width of road, that's all, that all goes and affects your offsets. And your first station of the day, 
if you put that one in, all the subsequent stations will just populate themselves. Just so long as you keep adding sample numbers. Then at the end of the day, uh, be sure to put the end station in there, what it actually was, particularly for the longitudinal core sheets. Because um, on the daily report down here, it's pulling from those core sheets the length of the longitudinal joint paved that day. So if you have that in incorrectly, you're going to have a wrong adjustment. Now going to the gradation sheets. Let's go QA. Uh, one thing you might notice if you've been in here before, you no longer have the ability to uh, label these field sample numbers on your own. Uh, what what happened uh, several times? Um, I noticed that people would label this something, go to the aggregate worksheets, pick that number. And then later on in the day, they would notice something's wrong with this. It's got an extra period in there, a couple spaces, or wrong, wrong something. And they would change this. And then they'd go back, and they would not change this. But what would happen is this was no longer valid, so all this test data would like blank out, and they wouldn't have they wouldn't have their test data, and they wouldn't know why because everything was filled in. So it's it's important to uh is another example why it's important just to keep correct data. And this is my way of trying to uh prevent that issue from happening. Uh going to the mixed data sheets now. Uh at the bottom here you'll notice this note telling you it's important to update the blend percentages. Um, you know, as it changes throughout the day, if you got your second test and they change the percentages, please. Please update that. I've noticed several times um, either these blend percentages or the aggregate properties on the summary sheet here, those are not entered. And then on the aggregate worksheets, dry bulk specific gravity is blank. This is being calculated from the mixed data sheet and your summary sheet. If you have all that filled in correctly and it's still not showing up, you may have a an older version of Excel, um, this would probably apply more to, to uh, consultants or contractors because I think I think we should all be up to date. Um, back on the mixed design for the mixed data sheets, the other thing I've changed recently, um, if you do if you have literally anything, any of these blue cells up here empty, you're not going to get your maximum theoretical density or your air voids. Um, there's a lot of times that this is almost entirely blank and, you know, this data can be used by materials and research. I'm pretty sure some of it is used elsewhere in the workbook and just that that's my way of making sure it all gets filled in. So we have accurate data on where we're, where we're doing our tests. Moving on to another sheet. The QC QAI comparison report, there's not a whole lot to do in here. Um, but one thing I, I think had come up was uh, some questions. So, you, you know, you pick your QC sample and your QA sample. They don't have to be the same number here. This, in this case, it's just both of them did one test that day. So it's 12 1 and 12 1, but this could be QC's 12 3. And it could be compared against your 12 one. It's just whichever one was was the one where you actually did your comparison. It can be whichever. And if you if you get your IAs back, it it, it will be you you can test uh, check it here. They probably check the tolerance on the sheet they're giving you anyway, but it's still a good idea, especially now, to put this data in here. If you uh, get get an IA that day, and I'll, I'll show why in a little bit. Um, let's see, one other thing. So talked about uh, importing QC. The next thing I might change this up a little bit later, but you can export PDFs. So basically, you click that, 
and make a folder somewhere, wherever you want, and just click OK. And take a little bit and get the PDFs printed here. Okay, so there. So it prints off the cutoff it on its own. And then the other one here, it's printing the full workbook. But I think I will have it so it only prints off the uh, daily report later. So it's just um, the daily report can be used, you know, to in your uh, payment adjustment PQEs for mat density and longitudinal joints. Then cut off if you're not going to use the mixed bitumen area of the of cars you can you know upload this sheet onto your pay quantity as well and i'll i'll get rid of the rest of this data i think because current the current guidance is to put the workbook in its excel format into the dropbox not as pdfs now uh, last thing with the macros here is the charting. So one of the QC testing requirements in the spec is to man maintain control charts. So I have the spec open here. They have all, this is where it's talking about, you need all of these charted and you need single test control limits, moving average control limits. And the workbook can do this and it's the contractor's responsibility to do this, but you can you can look at it yourself and it's fairly easy. And the reason they're supposed to be charting that is just a little bit later in the spec, we have limits for these. And if you are not, if you fall out of the limits, either in the, in the moving average or single target limits, you're supposed to stop paving and correct the issue. And you know, I don't know if the contractor will necessarily stop themselves paving if you don't notice that the, their targets are outside. So now how to import the charts. So it'll look pretty similar to the other things. Click import chart. And it's asking uh, select the folder containing the workbooks with the chart data. So this can be either your files, your your QA files if it has the QC data in, or if you have a folder with just the QC workbooks, you can select that one as well. I'm going to be using my own workbook, so I'm just it's in the same folder, so I'm just going to click OK. All right, took a little bit. It's opening 12 files, but now you can see we have the charts, the red lines. Solid lines are your single test limits. The blue hatched lines are your moving target limits. And you got your test limits, single points, your moving targets. You can see it's pulled, pulled all that in. Now let me open that with an older workbook. <clears throat> Go to lot six. Enable macros. So if I click import chart again, use the same folder I'm in, click OK. It's going to take less time, but you're going to notice there's less data in here versus, you know, lot 12. Because how I have this working, it will only pull in, this is lot six. So it's only going to pull in lots one through five. Because I, I just, I thought that would be the better way to do it. So you're only worrying about the chart up to this point. Um, yeah, so now you've seen how to actually import the charts. But now let's look at a couple, a couple of them in particular and uh, find some issues that we might have. So I'll go to the FAA. You can see it's pretty consistent. And then all of a sudden, Moving average drops because it looks like we have a zero fine aggregate angularity and we have a blink here. So something's something's going on with that. And I've tracked that down to lot nine. So we'll open that one up. I 
I think. Okay. So if we go to the cutoff, we'll see they paved around 3,600 tons. And QA, they have two tests. And they have, here's one filled out. So yeah, they only have one FAA test. So for having 3,600 tons, it's possible that they would only have done one FAA test. Um, you know, their their last these was at 20, 2,400 tons. So, and uh, you're only doing the FAA tests every, what, 3,000 tons, I think. So, but the issue is we have a field sample number in here. So someone at some point clicked, you know, oh, this is 9-2, and then there's no data in here. So if I delete that, close out of this and save, then import the charts again. You can see it fixed itself. Um, yeah, so it's very important. I think what was probably happening in that lot nine is that might have been pulled from a previous day where they did two tests and they emptied out this, you know, the data that was in here, but didn't delete this, and it's causing issues, you know, down the road that they might not have thought about. So that's why it's important, I think, to uh, just keep using using your template workbook, and don't don't keep copying over from previous days. Okay, let's look at asphalt content. So you can see here the the uh, test limits changed here in a uh, lot three. Now, this is fine. All that is is uh, on the summary here, we have target AC content. And on the first, and you saw it on the mixed design too, right away it was 4.9. And then they adjusted it down to 4.7. So this is this is normal. And that, that's not a thing to, uh, an issue, but just note that it can look look a little weird. Now, if we look at uh, bulk specific gravity and a couple other charts, here this test seven is a little bit out of the ordinary. And if we go to VMA, it's rather high and out of the ordinary. So, I mean, what's going on here? And this is in lot five. Okay, so we're in the so that uh, that seventh test was this test five one. So if you look here, aggregate blend percentages aren't changing at all. And if we go to gradation, you're gonna notice the this first test was a little bit more coarse than the others. So I mean, that's that's at least part of the reason why. Uh, this is so far out of the ordinary. But if you're not looking at your control charts, you might not notice that, you know, this is different. Something might be different if they, I don't know, pulled from their piles differently or something to get the, get it coarser in that point or aren't mixing their piles well enough. So if you see see the data and it's out regularly or, you know, just jumping back and forth, you might want to ask your contractor, you know, what's going on and can we try to fix it just to, Get rid of some variability. Uh, now, if we look at asphalt film thickness and your dust to asphalt ratio, you might notice the uh, test limits. They are just you know they they stopped at the ninth ninth lot there. We'll get to that in a second. But while I have these ones open, I just want to note that like this is a wrap mix, so uh, like your asphalt film thickness. Dust to asphalt ratio, those are going to be a little bit different. Like here, we're running low, but that's just we don't 
we don't really have anything. Uh, our film thickness values are kind of just based on a, a virgin mix. But why are these why are these uh, charts just blank here? And it looks like there's no data point here on the tenth either. So let's go to lot ten. Pretty sure I opened it, yeah. All right, look at the QC. Looks like we've got three tests, three tests and mixed data. Look at the cutoff and we have almost 4,300 tons. If we look at the aggregate worksheets, this is blank. Looks like we have nothing here. So we should have at least one, this one every 3,000 tons. So if you if you get this and you don't see something in here, you should figure out why. If it if they just forgot to put it in, if it got imported incorrectly somehow, and you have to put it in manually. But the uh, the workbook kind of expects expects at least one FAA test every day. So because this one is blank, it it's causing that discontinuity here with the graphs. Yeah. Uh, back on the summary, just want to hit this again. Uh, when you're going to pay for your for your lot again, make sure like your material paved on is correct. I know sometimes it's hard to, uh, you may not have the data to go back later to know if it was a paved surface or a milled surface if you're doing both at the same time. Because uh, 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 according to spec, the, the pavement and milled surface is technically the same. Same to them, they don't, they don't care about it. There's only a different pay factors for your aggregate base, reclaimed material and cold in place. Like I mentioned with uh, materials and research, they they would like to have this information. So please try and make sure this is correct. Um, I guess uh, last thing I want to hit on with the workbook itself is like reporting issues. Um, if you notice anything that looks wrong, or if you know it is clearly an error, please let me know. Um, I don't have the ability to, you know, solely work on this all year, and there there will always be bugs in here. And I mean, Excel can change and break functionality later on. Um, so if you if you do find something, please just email me the workbook or workbooks that are being affected. If you're, you know, trying to pull something in from a different one, and just describe the problem to me or give me a call or something. If I can replicate the issue, I will should be able to fix it for everybody in the future. Um, if it's something that's actually affecting pay and not just like a display thing or something, I will try to get to get to it and fix it as soon as possible. And then when I do, I can send you back uh, an updated blank workbook to use in the future, and I can get you uh, the fixed workbook with your data in it as well. Um, I mean, uh, just an example of why it's good to report issues. When I was putting together this presentation, I noticed that uh, these importing functions don't seem to work if you have your files on OneDrive anymore. Um, I'm pretty sure in the past I did have that working, but I'm pretty sure something either changed with Excel, OneDrive, or you know all of our security stuff and you know, trying to lock everything down. Um, I guess before I move on to my uh, next uh, next file, I want to show. Does anybody have any questions that I've of stuff I've gone over already? Okay. Close this. 
Um, I've been working on a, another tool to help us when when we're done with our asphalt paving projects. So um, in the workbooks now, I have another sheet that will pull in all the data like into the paving workbook that has like all the data for the aggregate quality test summary. Um, it'll be a hidden sheet on the workbook, so you're not going to notice anything. Ah. Um, I'm in the wrong folder, I think. Close that. All right. Like I said, it's not perfect yet, but um, so you open up the aggregate quality test summary. It's going to pop this window open, ask you where the where all the paving work, workbooks are, and so the this file itself doesn't need to be in that same folder, but you can only have a single paving project in that folder. And if you have like any other Excel workbooks that aren't the paving workbook in there, it's going to have some issues. And you just click OK. Now it's got, got your sieve data, all, all that stuff. And it's going to keep keep the uh, dates all together. It's not going to spill over a date onto a new sheet here. Um, one thing I don't have changed yet either, uh, these air voids, uh, this is this was just a, a set thing. It's actually pulling in the sieve limits, and I think I will probably change it so it does it with the air voids as well, because that'll change depending on which spec we're in now. Um, yeah, then when you're once you have this, it, there's some extra sheets here, so just highlight the sheets you uh, have data in, and print as PDF. And from here, you can just sign it, give it to your materials coordinator to sign. And I guess that I think is all I have, unless anybody has questions. Dan, you have a question? No, I actually meant to try and give you a, a clapping hand gesture and accidentally raised my hand. So nice job, Lauren. All right, thank you. Well, not seeing any questions. Thanks, Lauren. Next up, we got Ground Forks. Yeah, thanks, Josh. Um, we're running a little bit early, so that's good. Because I think we have UAS after this too, so maybe we'll be a little bit earlier to let everyone out. But uh, uh, first up, we have Brian Hatch. He's our Ground Forks District. One of our project managers has been with the department for about 24 years. He's going to kind of go over uh, asphalt uh, road inspection uh, from that perspective. He's got a lot of experience in there, so I'm just going to try to give uh, everyone some tips and tricks on what he does out there in the field from first thing in the morning to sunset. So, Brian, if you want to share your screen. Thanks a lot, Jesse. Uh, first of all, thanks for throwing out there that I've been here 24 years, so it's going to look like I probably know what I'm talking about for starters, <laughs> right? Yeah, that's right. Um, we'll do a share. And I'm going to change. I apologize if I'm a little jittery on the navigation. I've uh, I just got prepped on this this week. 
Can anyone see or everyone see uh, my screen so far? Yeah, but you're you're sharing your presenter view. I'm not sure if you want uh, everyone to see I, or not. I, so. Yeah, there you go. So uh, mistake number one. Um, maybe somebody could run back here. Give me a hand real quick. <laughs> Sorry. Thanks, Josh. This is obviously why uh, they gave us uh, Grand Forks District so much time. All good? How do we look now, folks? That looks good, Brian. Good, okay. Uh, again, as stated, my name is Brian Hash, Grand Forks District. Um, if you've looked at my employee resource picture, don't be uh, alarmed, I have aged. So simply said, everyone has different inspection styles uh, involved while paving asphalt. What I'm going to present today is a quick insight on kind of what I've done over the years. Um, up till last year, I haven't done a lot of asphalt inspection, but last summer I was uh, uh, involved in quite a bit. Um, so anyway, so this course is only going to be about 15 minutes. So if I'm missing any key points, don't worry. I'm going to share a link to an older HMA paving inspection checklist at the end. So. Uh, what do we got going on here? Okay. So a lot of asshole paving is more than just a random truck that shows up with some mix, right? Um, HMA inspection has a lot of working parts to, uh, involved in it. So you really need to be prepared. Uh, so kind of, what do I do first? Let's read the plans, huh? Prior to beginning your project, you know, read those plans up. Um, really focus on the notes, the scope of work, the basis of estimate, typical uh, sections, et cetera, et cetera. You're most likely going to have some incidentals on your project, so be prepared for that. Anyway, uh, can you examine these plans? You know, make any notes of questions that you might have, or you know, are there any conflicts out on the job? Make sure you know what's governing your standard specs. Uh, you know, simply, you know, a lot of us know this, but uh, keep in mind that your general plan notes override our standard specs. Supplemental specs will govern what our plan notes say. And lastly, our special provisions govern over our plans, supplemental specs, and our standard specs. Just keep that in mind. So plan notes and scope of work, you know, read those general notes determine details that are specific to your uh, project and aren't included in the specifications that are applying to this HPP paving job. Also take a good look at that scope of work. It gives you a good overview of what the paving locations are and any possible incidentals that you may uh, have going on on that project. I always love looking at that because it's real simple for me to, to read and I need simple stuff. Typical sections, normally typical sections are defined by their stationing. They can be RPs, but it's nice to use stationing uh, more finite. Um, there may be more, more than one typical station on a project, so compare them all. Make sure you're taking a good look at them. Um, the typical sections will normally give you a new pavement thickness. It'll give you a cross slope of the paved surface. It'll give you a location where the typical section changes and the type of HPP mixed, uh, whether you're using an FAA mix or a commercial grade. So keep a good eye on those. Basis of estimate. So where are my numbers coming from anyway? You know, what are they? Well, Plan quantities the bid item, are the bid items for the project. You know, remember that these bid items are least, are always listed by spec and code. So, you know, it'll give you your density of the material used to determine the quantities like the type of grade of asphalt cement, the asphalt cement content used to determine the quantities, the type and grade of a mass, uh, excuse me, uh, emulsified asphalt for the TAC code, coat, the application rate of emulsified asphalt for the TAC coat, and of course, you know, it's going to have your striping and core quantities, plus a whole much, much more. 
Anyway, so check these quantities of the bid items that are involved on your job. You know, generally these, these plans that we get, they're pretty accurate, but you know, uh, errors do happen. It's much better to find them earlier and avoid problems. Make sure that you organize your calculations to uh, identify where the material is being placed. You know, examples are like your main line, your shoulders, your turn lanes, the acceleration and deceleration lanes on your side roads and approaches, et cetera, et cetera. And then in essence, you know, there's a lot of prep time involved prior to even going out uh, for your first day's paving. So, you know, know where your numbers are coming from and where you're going to be at paving and, and whatnot. Anyway. For me, prior to starting the project, and if time permits, I really, really like to drive the project. You know, I'm out there looking for any possible unseen issues. You know, the beginning and the end of the pro excuse me, <clears throat> are the beginning and the end of the project locations good? You know, are they uh, correct on the plans and whatnot? Um, maybe there's some joint issues. Something that I look for every time I get on a project is a uh, I'm looking at the beginning and uh, of that project and there may be a big transverse crack five or ten feet away from where the plan uh, begin end of the project is so for me I I like fixing that like why I'm there you know it saves on on a lot of time and money you know and that uh, goes hand in hand with anything you see along the project that uh, maybe catch your eye you know and I'm not you know I'm not talking about a going from a, a thin lift overlay to a full reconstruct, obviously, but, you know, little things like a crack here and there and something that wasn't within the scope, you know, maybe go ahead and take care of it. Um, also, as you're driving down that road, you know, take a good look at your approaches, you know, your section line roads, your field approaches, your private drives, you know, and whatnot. Um, I mean, do you have any structures on the job? Um, maybe there's some bad approach panels that need some attention. Um, maybe you have some guardrail to deal with, you know, can you easily pave in these areas? I don't know. Um, how do your sloughs look? You know, simple observation usually lets you know if your typical sections are going to work or not. Moving along. There's a quick snapshot of a section line road, you know, I'm talking about driving your project. You know, are these... Uh, are they consistent with what the plans are saying? You know, for me, I look back at this at this particular uh, site. It was like it seemed like this approach was like so much bigger than than what I was seeing on the plans. But it's probably just the uh, screwy things going on in my brain. But the, the fact of it is, is that I was able to drive the job, take a look at these uh, locations and confirm that they're on uh, on the plans as stated. Um, also, you got any manholes on your project? You know, how many times do we quote unquote find these bad boys? You know, no one's happy when you're driving down, or pay, excuse me, paving down the road and and bam, you know, you hit one of these puppies and next thing you know, you got a two hour repair and everybody's standing around and not a lot of happy faces. I talked about possible uh, bridge work. Um, here's an example of an approach slab that we uh, ran into last summer. Um, the contractor was kind enough to put a little extra effort on this section of the road, and it, it resulted in a pretty amazing turnaround from what we had. As if I can make this work, I've got a little quick video here that I want to show. Basically, this is just. Uh, and, and we're done. That's all. <laughs> I try to be funny. The in in all actuality, the contractor took out quite a bit of the uh, quite a, quite a bit of the rough material out, and um, they were able to crack like the both the back and the head sections of the bridge approach panels. Um, this little attention to detail has really really improved this ride. Um, so kind of here's where it, uh, the uh, eastbound lane was repaired. And I was like, so totally pleased with what the contractor ended up giving us. Anyway, so moving along, 
you got any haul roads? Um, it's a good idea to know where the contractor is going to be entering, excuse me, entering and exiting the project. Um, you want to make sure that these these uh, they're using only approved roadways, um, you know, not taking any shortcuts, much like this guy up here. Um, here's a little snapshot. Um, one of our section employees sent me during our paving project. Uh, this is uh, coming out of one of our uh, plant sites. And it was kind of nice that he sent me this um, because it's little things like this, you know, we can jump on and get repaired during the fact uh, rather than, you know, it's the middle of October and we're two months past uh, paving and we're getting complaints from, let's say, the township or whatnot. And, and uh, you know, little things like this, you, it's a good thing to keep an eye on. And kudos to our section lead that sent me this. So we're ready to pave. Um, I guess a few things that I like to throw out there. I mean, like, is all the traffic control devices, have they been checked? Are they in place? Um, make sure you've looked over your 100, excuse me, your section 100 sheets, and you verify that you're using the correct layouts. Also, it's a good idea to make sure little things like the signing at the plant, you know, are those, uh, are those signs up, the trucks entering, the crossing signs, et cetera. Um, you can see this picture here. Uh, if it's anything you see wrong with it, I don't know. I kind of caught this right away when I was coming onto the project. Um, not really seeing any responses, but then again, I, I don't know what the heck I'm doing here with my uh, share mode. But the issue with this sign particular, it's uh, if you project this sign to the road, it's got about a 1.8 vertical clearance on the road so you know it could be a huge safety hazard uh thank god we caught it and we did have it uh i think with this particular sign they actually did move it outward and did get the uh, legal vertical clearance on it you're gonna need equipment list on your project um good time to get the equipment list for the you know your model make etc is when you're kind of sitting around you're waiting for the day to begin you know, it's a heck of a lot safer to do that rather than playing Frogger out there with all the equipment while the work's happening, you know, and it's, uh, for me, I, I find myself always uh, liking to communicate with the contractor and the operators time and time again, but getting this equipment list while they're sitting around, it's safe and it's kind of a good time to, to meet your staff uh, of operators that are out there. Uh, you got any pilot cars on your project? Um, you know, make sure that you're uh, keeping track of their, their return times. I like to see like 15, 20 to minutes, 50, excuse me, 15 to 20 minutes max. You know, if available, I like seeing the contractor use two pilot cars, especially if you're on a longer uh, project or a higher traffic volume uh, project course make sure that that uh, pilot car follow me sign is being used you know that's attached correctly and safely know your key players something else big for me uh, you know know your foremans out there your operators laborers confirm who's in charge of what you know communication's the key <clears throat> i've had projects where there'll be multiple foremans on the site and you know, that uh, can be really frustrating when it's the middle of the day and, and suddenly the paver's picked up and it's moving somewhere, but you don't know where. Or let's say your main line uh, just isn't getting enough tack, you know, what are you going to do? So, you know, who do you speak to if you have any of these issues? So kind of know, not kind of, but know who's in charge. Speaking of tack, uh, keeping an eye on the distributor can be challenging to say the least. Therefore, I personally like to stay in touch with the operator myself. Uh, it makes my day go easier. Uh, I mean, a lot of times the foreman, he's got his hands full with 30 other things going on. So I found uh, just a simple conversation with the, the distributor operator now and then kind of keeps me up to speed with what's going on. Um, not only, of course, you know, the, the volumes he's, he's shooting for throughout the day or whatever, but for some reason, it seems like these guys that have the, it seems like these guys that appear to have the least like jobs happen to know 
happen to know everything that's going on, you know, it's funny, but know your players, you know, it doesn't hurt also to remind them to fog seal before it's too late or God forbid uh, they've forgotten about it. Some base and speaking of uh, attack and distributed truck, here's some basic inspection items uh, for that truck. Um, check them on attack in the distributor, you know, make sure you're checking the temperature of the tack, make sure it's not too cool or it won't shoot properly, or if it's too hot, it's going to break in that distributor. Make sure you're collecting your samples, you know, when you get out there, hey, where are my sample containers? Make sure the spray bar is constantly heated. Know what your dilution rate is. Uh, your manifest will have that information on it. Make sure the paving surface is clean. If not, tack is going to bond to that bond to dust and dirt on the road and it can be picked up by the trucks or the paver. And it's just going to make a very bad mess. Um, make sure that all the nozzles are working properly. Make sure the bar height is uh, set at a uh, good vertical height so you're getting good coverage on the pace, pay, excuse me, on the paving surface itself. Make sure any vertical surfaces of tack are coated. You know, this is huge when we're in town doing uh, a running along curb and gutter, or if you're on a newly reconstructed road and you're and uh, you're paving next to uh, new concrete. <clears throat> Plant paving down, lay down temps. Um, less material, you can probably see for yourself but unless the material manufacturer's recommendation states otherwise and there's no recommendations on maximum mix temperature discharge di excuse me discharge that mix at a maximum temperature of 300 degrees uh, i can see in my slide here what i was showing and this is actually after lay down um, i actually i had had some higher temperatures and of course you know i'm going berserk uh, calling the plant talking to the foreman and whatnot and and uh, it's kind of a catch-22 when it says, well, hey, the manufacturer says one thing and we're doing something else. But, you know, a lot of us realize that you get those high temps and your, your gradation's changing, you're burning oil off the rock and, you know, a lot of, a lot of, lot of, not a lot of good things going on there. Um, or to the paving lay down, you know, some Quick numbers, remember, you know, when we're paving and it's it's uh, below 60 degrees, keep that mix at 250 or above. And when it's uh, 60 or higher, you can keep it at 230. That's acceptable. Paving. Ideally, the paver should never stop. Obviously, that's something that we only dream about, right? It's not a, actually a reality kind of issue, but... Hopefully there's enough trucks throughout the day so that your paver isn't constantly stopping and starting, you know. Um, since mix can stay at an acceptable temperature inside those trucks for a heck of a long time, I kind of prefer that the contractor allows some trucks to build up rather than constantly stopping and starting the paving process. I mean, overall, you're ultimately, ultimately going to get a much better product if you can avoid these issues. Try to keep that paver at a constant speed. Uh, here I am again with the temperatures. You know, I'm always carrying my temperature gun around. I'm constantly uh, up front checking temperatures as it's being distributed out of the truck. I'll go back to the screen and check uh, temperatures there. Of course, checking uh, temperatures behind the paver. I'm kind of always looking for temperature consistency. You know, you want to, it's, it's, days going pretty, pretty smooth when there's nothing jumping up to 323 like the previous slide but you know you're going to see a constant uh, temperature at all those those three sites that i uh, pointed out you want to avoid segregation uh, a few items i threw out here is at the hopper uh, at itself you know you want to make sure they aren't folding those wings up while you're paving uh, you can call cause gradation segregation uh, you want to check the level of the material in front of the screen. Make sure it's a constant. Uh, it's consistently at the midpoint of the auger here. And then again, you know, we talked about keeping the, the paver going at a constant speed. You know, you don't want that uh, hopper to run empty and 
between the truckloads. You know, I want to keep it at a third or halfway full at least all the time. You want to check those sloughs, make sure that you're uh, that they have the proper slope and that they're compacted. Um, a lot of you know if you don't don't keep an eye on your sloughs, and it just blew me away way back. This blew me away way back in my early years how much mix that can be eaten up. You know, if you're not washing your slough, you know, it's just obviously a lot of us work for numbers and you know where I'm coming from with that statement. But, you know, be constantly checking those width and that slope. You know, if it basically in a nutshell, this paver paver gets set, you know, they get their slough box on there or whatever their uh, functionality is. They should be able to get it set keep it and run it and then you're good to go. Um, with the amount of center line rumble strips that we were installing, you know, it's good to get great impact compaction on that center line. You know, it's crucial. You know, some of the projects uh, that we do have follow that, S that SSP4 notched wedge, you know, and right here I got this uh, appendix A drawing. Um, so last summer, the uh, contractors bringing out all this equipment prior to starting out the first day, day one, and I'm like, what's going on here? Anyway, so I got a video of uh, a slough box that they designed to perform the uh, schematic of the, or excuse me, the cross section of that Appendix A notched wedge. And Sorry for, you gotta be kind of a contortionist to watch this. I was gonna tell everybody that I used the drone to film this, but not really. Anyway, so the slough box actually produced this nice wedge that the Appendix A showed. And then if, if you saw in the back uh, towards your right, right, somewhere right here, um, that's actually a, a mini vibratory roller that's compacting during this procedure. Kind of a cool deal. And uh, here's an end product after coming through it. It, le it left a really nice clean, to clean, excuse me, clean seam to work with, as you can see. So you're going to be paving. You're going to fog seal. <clears throat> Make sure that only this only seal the required limits. Um, you know, you can go ahead and read your basis ten. Excuse me, section ten basis of estimates. You know, most likely you're only fogging that main line. Um, something I always like to see is this uh, plan note, you know, fog seal after final rolling with a minimum te mat temperature of 125 degrees. Uh, the reason I like to see that, it kind of allows me to get out and mark out cores before it gets too late in the day, you know, versus the contractor just paving all day into sun sundown and then he's fogs everything and then you're kind of stuck out there wearing a miner's helmet trying to mark out cores. Uh, speaking of coring, I had a section here on uh, the core sheet itself, but I'm going to say thank you to Lauren Lee. He kind of showed everybody uh, on their our workbook spreadsheet, or excuse me, the spreadsheet out of our workbook. And I was going to just pull up uh, an example here of how it populates itself. Um, but uh, I'd like to say that Lauren did a pretty good job. And so I'm probably happy that you're not seeing what I was going to present to you. Thanks, Lauren. Moving along, um, tickets. <laughs> so I'm going to throw out a thank you here to Ethan from Devil's Lake. Uh, so if you guys remember last week, he and uh, Jason Hunter uh, shared uh, on tickets. Um, I can't remember the exact terminology on on what their presentation was stating as uh, what they did, but I feel uh, like I stated here. I feel every district's kind of got their own procedure. It's kind of like whatever works best. But honestly, you know what what Ethan and Jason uh, presented last week. I'm gonna I'm strongly leaning towards using that. Um, but bottom line, uh, on these tickets, I think one thing that's really important that I want to point out is, is make sure that, that the contractors are following our section 10906 B1 through 10 spec, you know, on the excuse me, on the ticket information that's required. Any waste. 
worker in the production, you know, you want to stay in, in touch with your plant inspector. Um, they'll need to know the field, road waste, you know, for their cutoff. Um, also, you know, you need to have an agreed waste at the end of the day with your contractor. I did have a quick story I was going to share. I was coming to the header at the end of a project and uh, the town I was standing or the town I was in, I was basically looking at an elevator with a scale and I was stating to the uh, foreman, I said, you can just run the truck over there. We can get a quick waste. And he was out of it. No, we're going to send it to we're going to send it to the uh, plant, which is like 20 minutes away. And we went back and forth but the. Uh, the funny thing is, is, is I couldn't believe I, that he uh, was denying me this the opportunity. I could have hit the, could have hit the uh, elevator with the rock. But there's more to the story, and I'm just going to move on. Inspection reports. Um, there's a few items, but not all. You know that. I'm sure a lot of people will put in their reports, but uh, what I like to get in there is, you know, your beginning and end stations for the day, all your stations for the section line, private diet field, field approaches, both left and right that you've uh, paved that day, record your, excuse me, recorded lay down temperatures throughout the day, your yields, your tons, you know, course waste, uh, any disruptions, breakdowns, mainline at the plant, whatever. Uh, was your traffic control good? Um, were there any issues? And of course, all of your equipment. Um, you're going to want to put in your uh, your scale checks throughout the day, at least a minimum of one. And uh, last but not least, uh, attached documents. Uh, pictures tell a thousand words. And even though I've been here whatever X amount of years, this is still an area that I can still work uh, work on getting better at. Anyway, in ending, you know, uh, we all have our own inspection styles and, and some work better than others. Um, for myself, I've always been uh, trying to keep a good line of communication with the contractor. Let them know that we're all human. You know, we all make mistakes. And, you know, this approach itself, you know, from for me has worked for a better part of my career. So um, lastly, Thanks to everyone for listening to me and giving you my time. And uh, are there any questions? Hey, Brian, this is uh, Ed. Uh, I promised you I had six. Well, here, I got to go ahead and mute you. Go ahead. No. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. I know uh, you guys do an excellent job on the road. There's uh, so many uh, different aspects that you're looking at, uh, especially if there's milling on the job uh, you got another set of equipment to uh, inspect and working from four in the morning till 10 o'clock at night uh, um, I guess my question is what what in the past have you felt has been the biggest uh, issue uh, in dealing with contractors I almost said where do I start um, you know that's that's a great question, but you know, right off the top of my head, and I, I was lucky enough to finish my presentation with it, is communication. Um, I found uh, communication, it was the key to any job that I'm having success on. I know that when I started way back in the days, you know, um, times have changed, you know, I, I, uh, then the elder inspectors that I had, or we'd call them old timers or whatever, had a different approach to how they would uh, work with the contractor. It was basically do it my way or no way, and and that's it. Um, my style of, of inspection has been to get a great uh, line of communication with the uh, contractor, because like I stated, um, you know, we're all human, we all make mistakes. And if, if you're working with them and I, if, you know, there's going to be times that I miss something and they'll pick up on it. And if I've been, if I've been cool with them, you know, they'll let me know and they'll work with me versus uh, if I'm just being a hard, hard hat on them, you know, they're just going to say, oh, we'll let it go. And it's too bad. It's so sad. But 
Um, I think if I answered your question correctly, I think that it was garnering that line of communication, you know, getting that trust. I don't know if I explained that well enough, Ed. Right. Yeah, I think uh, you I know, can, that's I the I can try to answer Ed's question too from my perspective is last couple of years with um, only name contracts, but specific contract been having issues with um, well, essentially spec 704040.4, which is the uneven shoulder and adjacent lane spec where it specifies if the difference in elevation between the shoulder and the driving lane is two inches or greater, construct a slope at the edge of the driving lane that is four one flatter. Well, these paving contractors, they're not really caring about the aggregate shoulders or worried about their production. So we've been having a lot of issues with them where that we're having that two inches or greater at, at that slough and it's not flatter than a four to one and trying to get them to do it has been proven difficult at times where we basically had to threaten to shut them down until they get it corrected. So last couple of years, that's that's been a big issue on paving jobs from, from my perspective. I guess I won't ask six, Brian, but what, just one more. Uh, um, in the past, <laughs> we've had a lot of uh, issues, you know, with traffic control and and keeping signs uh, up to where they should be. Uh, and and now with the rumble strips, uh, that added another aspect to it. H has that improved in the last couple of years, or is that still a challenge? Um, Ed, are you referring to the rumble stops, I, which I did not cover? Or are you talking? Please. Yeah. Is the, that what? The the rumble strips that go along with the flagging operation. Oh, gotcha. Yeah, that's what I was thinking you were addressing. I'll tell you what, man, I, I was so lucky last summer. Uh, the few contractors I had, they did an outstanding job maintaining the rumble stops. Um, most of the time, I, I didn't have to remind them to get them moved. Um, and I, I, I can barely or rarely remember having to... Uh, you know, if I drove drove by them, I didn't have to get them adjusted in the correct uh, sequence that they sh they should, you know, for spacing or whatnot. But the rumble stops, I was lucky. Um, I had great contractors last summer that took good care of them and utilized them all summer. Um, you know, you didn't have to constantly babysit uh, babysit them on that aspect of their traffic control. Yeah, that's that's good to hear. Anyway, if you probably noticed, I got the the uh, link, or excuse me, the path here to that uh, checklist that I was promising you. It is an older checklist, but thanks for your time. Thanks, Brian. Really good information. Love the pictures, too. Jo Josh, did you want us to keep on going or take a little break? Or... No, you can keep on going. Yeah. Uh, next up, we have Kurt Dunn. Uh, he's the Grand Forks District Materials Coordinator. He's been with us the department for 28 years. Is that right, Kurt? 28? Did I get that right? Pretty close. Yeah. 27.6. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, Kurt's going to go over, uh, you know, the perspective of Asphalt Lab, um, the duties, day-to-day -day duties uh, in there. So take it away, Kurt. Okay. I'll share my screen here. Okay. Get into the slideshow mode here. Okay, welcome everyone. And to the asphalt plant inspector training. And so I'll uh, get right into it here as far as the uh, <clears throat> Get the thing to work here. Okay, so my first slide here, I just want to go over what the definition of standard specifications are. And it's uh, just the a, a compilation of written requirements for performance of the work, provides requirements for the quality of materials provided, provides description of the equipment necessary to do the work. And as an asphalt plant inspector, uh, I would recommend or, uh, that you um, familiarize yourself with all the areas that um, would pertain to HMA pavement. And some of those sections would be like section 154, which is the equipment section, and section 109 and, and, and section 706 is field labs and certifications is 109. 
And then the, the general hot mix asphalt specification is section 430. And then the material requirements are, are, are uh, section 800. So uh, it would um, it would help for you to to spend some time to read these sections because uh, basically everything that's out there today and everything that's done is is really in the standard specifications. The other manual that we want to make sure that we um, know about too here is the field sampling and testing manual from the uh, that's. Uh, published by the North Dakota DOT and the materials and research section. And this should be a, also by your side in the lab. And it's gonna basically tell you what type of materials uh, that need to be tested. And uh, you know, what types of tests that need to be tested, uh, done on them as far as, and then the, the, the tests, make sure they're run correctly and how often, and then there's protocols in there also about uh, how to proceed when tests do not correlate with the contractors. And there's random numbers, uh, ways to do random numbers in there too. So there's a lot of great information that th this should be at your side. So the role of an inspector. Inspection is one of the most important processes in any highway project. Quality of the finished product typically reflects the quality of the inspection performed. Uh, an inspector must be honest and fair, exercising responsibilities with firmness and good nature. Uh, the inspector must work cooperatively with fellow employees, supervisors, and contractors to promote the progress of the work. Uh, and then communication between the asphalt plant inspector and the asphalt paving inspectors is, is very important. There are a number of things uh, that both should know at the same time, uh, and there are lots of things, and they should be in continual uh, conversation throughout the day uh, you know whether there's for example if there's breakdowns at either either location or or uh, how many trucks are on the perhaps on the road or how many uh how much mixes have been put out already um things like that so there's it's it's only it's only good to be able to keep in good communication with with the asphalt plant or paving inspector as well so so some definitions uh Hot mix asphalt is probably our only full-fledged quality control, quality assurance uh, specification. And there's a there's a few definitions that it'd be interesting because we kind of use them through the the, uh, the presentation here. So uh, quality control is mixing and placing of the HME ingredients in a prescribed manner, so as so it's reasonable to expect the pavement <clears throat> to perform uh, properly, and that's the responsibility of the contractor. And the quality assurance is the assurance, you know, assurance activities necessary <clears throat> to provide confidence the HMA payment being constructed will satisfy the given requirements. And that's the responsibility of the engineer's team, including the asphalt pavement inspector. And independent assurance is the unbiased and independent evaluation of all the sampling and testing that's going on out there and used for acceptance. And that's the responsibility of the district materials lab. Now, uh, an asphalt plant, what, what, what does it actually do? It, the purpose of an asphalt plant is to blend the aggregate binder and the, and the additives used together at an elevated temperature to, present, to produce a homogeneous mix. So there's lots of, there's several types out there of plants. And <clears throat> years ago, you probably saw more uh, batch plants as you see over to the left here. Uh, but now you see more, uh, the drum dryer types, and uh, there's a parallel flow and there's a counter flow. Uh, mostly what you see out there is parallel flow, like this one here. And it, it has about, you know, just an overview. Uh, you've got your stockpiles that I made earlier, and then you've got your uh, cold feed bins that all of the different stockpiles go into. So you've got a cold, you've got an aggregate supply system, and, a, and a, this belt here actually is combined, or the like the charging conveyor that has the cold feed uh, coming up to the drum. And you've got the drum dryer itself that mix heats, mixes, and uh, all the ingredients together. Here's your wrap. There might recycled asphalt pavement is something that we're using more of these days. Uh, we're trying to save on our aggregates as well as the asphalt by residual binder that's in the wrap is used also in the mix. 
And then we have our asphalt supply system over here. We have a mission control system, takes care of all the exhaust. And then some of the dust uh, gets collected here, can be put right back into the uh, plant. And then once it uh, once the material or the product is made, it goes up an elevator into a surge silo where it can be uh, deposited into the to the delivery trucks. And so just a little bit more on that, I've taken some pictures over the years. And so even before these asphalt projects start any and during the project, there's a lot of uh, usually there's a lot of uh, processing of the aggregates. Uh, this this is a crusher over to the left. And it's making the stockpiles of rock and, and crusher dust, the, the byproduct of crushing the rock. And there's also, we use a lot of uh, some of the screen material back into it. And uh, the, a couple of picture, the, the pictures at the bottom here are, are, are of the recycled asphalt pavement that is uh, most likely been milled off the pavement uh, prior to the overlay or whatever going on it. And so that also has to be treated like an aggregate um, uh, material too, uh, except that it has some binder in it. So that's a special part of that. Um, so once once the stockpiles are made, then the and the project starts. So this is kind of the main workhorse out there that does all the uh, delivering from the stockpiles to the to the uh, to the separate bin splits in on the plant. And there, it's actually quite interesting to watch watch them once in a while how they how they can actually usually one um, one of these can be used for just the whole job and it's they really get their work out of these things so uh, so once it uh, once the material is in these uh, separate bin splits so all the different components uh, as you can see over there's a schematic I have on, on to the upper right here and that uh, every one of those bends you see to the to the top left there is uh, has got something like a schematic like this under underneath it and it's actually uh, 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 depositing on on a conveyor at a certain rate uh, if it's 20 percent uh, it's gonna if it's all these materials are 20, you know, 15, 20 percent, whatever it is, they have to gauge that. It all has to be calibrated uh, to make sure that it, uh, it it puts out the right amount. Uh, there's also uh, moisture. What complicates it a lot is the fact that there's moisture in all this. So they, it all, that has, has to be allowed for. And so the bottom two pictures are just photos of once the material leaves those uh, aggregate bin splits, it has to go on like a scalper. And these scalpers have a certain size. I think it's like a half an inch or something that it has to be more than the actual uh, uh, gradation, nominal maximum size of the gradation. But the main purpose here is to get the oversize off it. And there's actually one like this for the for the recycled asphalt pavement too. So once it actually gets up the, you know, makes it through the scalper, then it's going to go up this uh, conveyor here. And this is the main conveyor that has all the aggregates on. It's all combined. It's what they call the some call it the coal feed belt, but some will call it the charging conveyor. That's the one that's going to lead up to the to the drum. And you can't really see it very well, but on this particular conveyor now, there's actually what they call a way bridge. And this way bridge actually um, something like kind of looks like the one up here in the top up here where I have the pointer, but. Uh, this weigh bridge will actually weigh it at an instantaneous value what's going over the on the belt. And then there's another mechanism here that actually times it for a certain time. And then there's a totalizer at the bottom here where it actually totalizes all up, it all up. So you actually get a rate and like, for instance, tons per hour. And that's 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 an important term in in in, in the asphalt is, is a rate because everything has to be geared to certain tons. And so moving on, then the once it gets to the dryer, then then uh, with a parallel flow, it, it actually hits the heat uh, right away. And this can be up to, you know, fourteen hundred degrees Celsius. And this is when it, when it actually hits the burner is the burner over to the top left here to showing it from the side. And then the drum is tilted and it helps in getting the, the aggregate to flow through uh, more of a gravity. Uh, has gravity working for it 
And so it probably spends, you know, four or five, six minutes uh, in the uh, in the drum, the aggregates, depending on the moisture. And there you can see over here to the lower left, uh, they're what they call uh, flights. And they have to make sure these things are uh, uh, in good working order. It's kind of like your dryer at home, you know, it's uh, it. It revolves and it has flights in it, and the reason why is it, it catches the clothes, and it, in the case of the aggregate, it, it puts it in kind of a veil or a thin sheets, and then the aggregate can, or the the burner can actually uh, dry it a lot better. And uh, so over here, over to the middle left here is the wrap conveyor. It's just like a, and that has a weigh bridge on it too, and it's it's dumping in the the wrap recycled asphalt payment into this wrap collar and that's about two-thirds down the the uh uh the burner and we normally they experience has shown that if, if they if they run the recycled asphalt payment through the the burner it will burn off the or damage the residual binder that's that's in it so they 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 feel like they could you know downstream uh they can be added and then it can uh, all the other hot aggregates will heat it up pretty fast. <clears throat> and this is just a photo that was taken a couple of years ago that we had of this same drum that's up at the top here of the, uh, with a thermal camera uh, showing all the different temperatures uh, as it's going. If you can notice when they actually put the wrap in that it actually cools it down because, you know, 20 percent of wrap at, say, 70 degrees uh, actually cools it down fairly fast, but it warms up enough uh, before it gets all mixed. So here's the asphalt supply system, and uh, that's quite a interesting thing of itself. Uh, the most, well, basically all the uh, binder is trucked in by it transports here, as we see, and then they're put. It's put into, it's pumped into these heating tanks, and and they get up, to, you know, they heat them uh, up to around 300 degrees somewhere in there. And then there's a pump system here that actually pumps at a certain rate into the plant. And you can kind of see a little bit here, the little green pipe that goes in. It'll go and actually goes into the back of the drum. And, and this is all hooked up to the computer in, in, the, in the control shack. And, and it, it'll tell you, you know, how much, what the rate is. Uh, for instance, in this case, it's uh, a certain amount of tons per hour. This is just a schematic of one of these tanks. Uh, and actually, up to this day yet, we, we still stick, we call stick the tank and that we do that at the beginning at the end of the day. So we know how much asphalt was used during the day. Uh, we also can keep track of it with totalizers, uh, with the totalizer that will show up in the computer. And so um, here's the bottom right is, is you can see the, uh, this is where the, the binder comes in, the hot binder, and it mixes with the, uh, with the uh, hot superheated aggregate and wrap. And that's where all the mixing goes, takes place, maybe about 10, 15 feet. And then it's it's all ready to go and, and goes out the uh, delivery. So uh, this is just uh, something that um, when, when you have material uh, that comes to the plant, it comes in gallons, uh, hot gallons, we call it. And, and so asphalt cement expands when heated. The volume of the asphalt uh, at 300 degrees is a greater volume than at 60 degrees. So these two schematics I have here in the middle, uh, uh, they're, one is hotter and it, it's taking up more volume, but it still weighs the same. So we have to buy, when we buy uh, asphalt from on these projects, uh, we, we do it by the ton. And so before the asphalt can be used in the plant, it has to be uh, adjusted to a volume of a, a standard temperature at 60 degrees Fahrenheit. And actually at 60 degrees Fahrenheit, you can't even, I mean, the uh, the binder is is like, uh, you can't pour it at all. I mean, you can hardly stick your finger into it. it it's, it's that's how it is on the road right now, it's stiff. And, and so that's how we buy it though, at, at that particular temperature. So a gallon of that um, has a certain specific gravity at 60 degrees, and as we'll see. So I've got a little example problem here for, um, so for instance, say a transport loaded at 5,000 gallons comes to the to the site, it has three, it's 300 degrees, uh, the temperature. And so how many gallons of AC in the transport 
is in the transport based on the standard temperature, and I should that should say six, 60 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, so this first thing is that you've got your truck over here and it's got 5,000 gallons in, so you're gonna wanna reduce that down to a standard temperature of 60 degrees. So in other words, the volume is gonna go down and er, and the gallons. So actually you 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 uh, you go to your your pocketbook of of uh, useful information and you can get the uh, the correction factor that will bring it down to uh, a certain temp or uh, reduce the gallons of it in there. So actually this this truck now, if it was reduced down, if it was all cooled down to sixty degrees Fahrenheit, uh, you would only have forty five ninety three point five gallons in it, which isn't a whole lot of difference, but it's enough. So now in B here, we want to know what the tons are. That's what we're really really want to know because that's how we buy it is in tons so the specific gravity for we'll just use this as, the, as an example it varies a little bit but it generally is around 0 0.030 and so uh the sp specific gravity of water is one and that's the the water is about 8.34 gallons a uh, a pounds per gallon so we just take the 8.34 times 1.03 and that'll give us the actual weight of the uh, binder in a gallon. If you filled, put the binder in a gallon container, it would weigh that much, just a little bit more in water. And so just going through the calibration or going through the calculations that your, your gallons would actually times the pounds divided by 2000 would actually give you the 19.6 tons. So that's how much uh, 5,000 hot gallons weigh, weighs, 19.6 tons. That's how you figure that out. So moving forward here, I'm going to just kind of talk a little bit about the calibration of the plant because the asphalt plant inspector should know about the calibration system. And it's a good idea for the inspectors to, at the pre-job or sometime, to let the contractor know that they want to be out there when they're, when they're doing this stuff because it just gives them more assurance than when the plant starts that things are, are in good shape. It's um, there's a lot of things to do on these projects uh, before the, as the job actually starts. So, uh, so in the case of the asphalt, it's very important that the the supply system, uh, the whole plant itself, is delivering the right amount of material uh, to everything. And so, as far as the asphalt is concerned, um, the way they calibrate it is they've got once again we've got the the, the tanks now there. Uh, you know, the hot gallons. So the pump is going to pump all this out and, and, and it's going to meter it. And it's going to, the, the computer is actually going to reduce all that down to what we need, like we just did in that example problem. It actually takes these hot gallons and, and turns them into a, uh, it reduces it down to the 60 degrees Fahrenheit and then it takes it times the, the weight, the specific gravity and gives you the tons in here. So these numbers here are the like the bottom one here is the tons per hour or whatever it was. And, and, and so in the same process though, uh, at the same time, what they do is they take just take a teared truck, for instance, and they run the 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 oil into the teared truck and then they go weigh it. And then if they're within say 1% or whatever the the uh uh, tolerance is, then that's good. I mean, be, whatever was metered and shows up on, on the computer, whatever was weighed physically uh, should be very close. And, and if that's the case, then things are good that way. They do the same thing for aggregate. And once again, uh, before before this uh, this uh, conveyor, here's your, your charging conveyor going up to the drum mixer, and uh, they have the weigh bridge on it. It weighs it, sends it to the computer, tells you the rate that it's, that it's working. So then also they can physically do this again with say a, a truck box full and go and weigh this. And it should be very, very close uh, to what's actually metered uh, on the computer here. So uh, that's how they do that. And then when you put it all together, uh, this is where the computer really comes in because they, uh, everything has to talk to, to everything, you know? It, it uh, for instance, the aggregate, the computer knows, senses how much aggregate is uh, being brought up. And, and it also allows for moisture. And so then it talks to the pump and the pump starts to deliver uh, what they need. Now, the meter is going to be checking this all the time and getting information back to the computer. 
sometimes the material might, the temperature might change in the material. And if that's the case, then that, that means that say if the hotter this is, um, the less weight is going through of, of it because it's it's expanding. So they're gonna want, they have to do some adjustments, you know, one way or the other. It all has to talk to each other. It's amazing these new plants, how they can, uh, how uh, accurate it is once they get this whole thing calibrated. And the main reason they're calibrating this a whole system here is because they want, if you want 100 pounds of mix going up this, going out of this drum up into the truck, you want exactly 94 pounds of dry aggregate and six pounds of, or six, you know, six tons of of, uh, of uh, binder. And so we don't want it to change anything. At the end of the day, that's what we want in there. We have a little bit of tolerance that we'll allow, but but that's it. So it's to their benefit that the plant is calibrated. And so this is the last segment, basically, as far as the, the plant is concerned, is the, once everything is, is, is made, this is coming out of the drum, it goes up the uh, conveyor and it's ready to be, uh, it, this will hold quite a bit, quite a few truck loads and, and, and then the trucks just go under and take it to the plant or to the site. So, okay, we'll switch gears just a little bit here talk about um, one of the first things that the engineer is going to want to do is when they go in to put personnel on their project to is to assign testers and this is important because if that does not happen the uh, um, they cannot the testers and inspectors can't can't access the drop the materials drop box <clears throat> so that's that's an important first step. So inspector duties, um, primary responsibilities to assure the acceptable quality of the bituminous mix, uh, continuous testing for quality and uniformity of materials used in the in the mix. So, so the separate things like the aggregate, and then we also uh, check the uh, final mix as, as well. And so there are many, uh, besides this, there are many other important duties to be familiar with, which we will talk about here. So <clears throat> one of the first ones, I think too is is when we arrive at the plant and we're um, is to make sure that we get all these scales or scales everywhere. So we want to make sure that we get all the the scales have been certified by a, 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 a reputable company, and so that's very important. And then field laboratories. This is where you'll be spending most of your time. And uh, on these QCQA projects, the uh, there, there's two labs. There's a there's a contractor lab and there's an engineer lab. So the contractor, this comes right out of the specifications, basically that, that they have to provide, they have to have a lab that they can uh, do the with the equipment necessary to do the QC testing, and includes a gyratory compactor, and uh, it also has to do they all they have to do all their functions in that lab and not not the engineer's lab that we have, and so the inspector. Um, we have to share uh, the gyratory compactor with them so that we can do our tests too, our verification tests. And then the contractor has to place uh, the laboratory that we work in, the QA laboratory, at a site near the contractor's laboratory and where the, it does not interfere with the lab uh, or the plant operations like the vibration and stuff. So the engineer will have full control of that laboratory. And, and as an inspector, you must, you know, when you get on site there, you wanna make sure it's in the proper place and mounted on a firm foundation and level and, and make sure that it's safe, uh, the railings and the steps going up. And uh, that it meets all the standards, like there's a standard for what a, seven, a 706 there, what the laboratory, the measurements and, and the dimensions of what they are. and. So it's a good thing to look at that. And this is a good thing to, to talk about at the pre-job. You know, how's the lab? What's, what is, maybe even have them have a picture of the lab. And they should, it should meet all this before it even goes on site, you know, so. And then we wanna make sure we go through, once we're in that lab, we wanna make sure we go through with the contractor or the QC inspector, or somebody to make sure that we, um, the condition of it before and after, uh, that's a good thing to do. So, um, so moving on from there, 
So the in our laboratory or the QA laboratory, the contractor will have to furnish some equipment according to the specifications, some of the bigger equipment like the shakers and the and the ovens and 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 bat, water baths and things like that, rice rice equipment. And then the duties that uh, some of the things that we have to provide are like uh, sieves or like the district materials lab will have the sieves and scales and, and flasks calibrated and everything and, and 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 the FAA equipment, the sound equivalent, the things of that nature, all the other miscellaneous stuff, thermometers. So <clears throat> the contractor has to provide with these labs and this equipment that they're providing, it all has to be calibrated and and certified uh, according to the quality laboratory program. And then they also have to provide testers that meet the, the testing certification program, North Dakota DOT. And so the inspector want, will want to verify all that, make sure that every all the equipment is in good good condition and, and that all the testers have been certified. They can go online here at the online registry and find that out. And this is another very important uh, form that we should be filling out and that is, and, and you can work with the, the inspector can work with the district materials lab to go through both labs and get all the certifications off these equipment and make sure we list it, make, make sure it's all listed and, and everything is certified. That's, that's very important. And so then another thing in the specifications that the contractors need, needs to require is quality control uh, plan. And this is, uh, uh, something that you know they have all basically will have all the names of, of uh, the people involved in the QA QC program uh, inspectors on the road uh, testers uh, who's in charge of the control of the mix and, and so and then there's details should be details like for pit operations and and, and they they even will uh, you know have a kind of like a site layout which is a neat thing uh, what what are they going to do if something goes wrong? How are they going to keep the aggregates from getting segregated? Not, it should all be in there. That's something that we should make sure we're familiar with as an inspector and that we uh, make sure they're in the labs. And then another thing is the engineering quality control plan. Uh, that is not near as involved other than the fact that they, they want to make sure, you know, we give the contractor access to all our phone numbers uh, also, and that should be in the labs. So, um, one of the things, once you get all this stuff done now, and you finally get sat down in the lab, you can actually look at some of these things that on the mix design, as, as Lauren was talking about earlier today, and, and you can get a lot of it just right out of the uh, the cover sheet to start with. But they, the contractor has to provide us with a mixed design before we start. And then the materials, district materials lab verifies those mixed designs to make sure they're ready to go. And uh, so hopefully that's all been done and, and you have a copy. And so there's a couple of, so we're basically a mixed design is just the, the objective is to, to determine the combination of AC and, and aggregate that will give a long lasting performance of the pavement. So the final goal really is to select a, a unique asphalt cement binder that will achieve all of the balance of all of these properties we want it to meet. And there are a lot of properties with super pave. So, uh, so I just wanna go over a couple of things from the summary here, just kind of highlight them here. Uh, so the, the inspector is gonna know what kind of binder they're gonna use on the project. They're also gonna know what gyrations. Now this has been fairly standard 75 here for many, many years. To, to run these gyrations that like in the gyratory for the mix. But nowadays uh, there are a few jobs out there that actually have less than that. So you wanna make sure you check that. And also this particular segment here talks about the total amount of material that's in, or asphalt cement that's in the mix. And this may include any residual binder that is in that comes from the wrap or the recycled asphalt binder. And so these, and, and the rest of this stuff here basically is showing that it, it meets all the specifications. And this area here will tell you here, for instance, now this project 
uh, actually did have the example I showed here actually does have some uh, recycled asphalt pavement in it. So uh, the total 6% that we showed in the previous slide, well, 5% is going to be virgin add oil. And this will most, this will prop, this will be your target that when you start the job, the contractor is going to have to adhere to that unless there's some sort of target change later on, but they'll start out with this. And that's what they want to put in the mix, 5% by weight of, uh, of the mix. And so another thing you want to get is some of the specific gravity information here to start with, so you can do some of your uh, physical property testing with it. And uh, so this is the blends that are used, and it's a good thing to make sure that uh, this, these are the blends they're going to start with. And if not, then you need to communicate with uh, someone to find out why uh, we're not starting at these. But here, here we have all the different uh, components. Uh, we got some dust, rock, things, natural finds. We also have our recycled asphalt pavement, which is 15% of the mix. And uh, this, this sheet here, and I will just basically talk about this virgin uh, gradation here. This is a target value. Uh, this is a, a result of probably uh, months of testing, quality testing, control testing that the contractor done during the production of the aggregates. And so they're pretty confident that this average is, is about where they're going to be running on their tests when they do gradations out there. And so this is, the, and we're going to be doing gradations here too. So what we want to do with that now is there's a table in 4, 430 that talks about uh, single tests and movie test averages. And and if we if we expect the contractor, for instance, to run and, and hit these uh, values right on the button, it isn't going to happen. So, and the reason is because the in, the inherent variability uh, variability of the material, uh, and so we will tolerate or will allow a certain range for them to work in, and that's what this is: the single test control limit. Now, we also we don't take every sieve here either. We just take control sieves. The control sieves for super pave is half, four, thirty, and two hundred. So those are the only four you need to worry about. And so what we do then is we take this, and this is something that you should do uh, for your own good. It might be done already by the contractor, but to, to make this little table out, and for instance, on the four, we would round that off to 54, and then you would go plus or minus six of that. So this is the range actually that the contractor will work in when they do grades, and you too, uh, as an inspector or tester. So um, now we'll get into some of the testing here. The contractor, this is right out of the spec pretty much that, you know, this, the contractor shall perform random QC sampling and testing of aggregate and asphalt mix as specified in the testing manual. And so what they do uh, for every test they take, and they're going to do most of the testing out there. Um, they're going to take it, uh, they're going to take splits. They're going to they're going to split it in our presence. And they're going to take that split and they're going to go back and run it. The other half they're going to give to us. And all we do with this is we put it aside and make sure it's secure for a certain amount of time here. And if all the tests work out, then we can get rid of it. We don't test this one. This is just a, a split that gets set aside. And that's all there is to that one. And so speaking about speak uh getting samples we want to make sure that we know where the uh, aggregate sampling devices are at the plant and what type of sampling device and we want to make sure that we approve this before it starts the engineer has to approve these sampling devices and um so the frequencies for these tests the contractor is to run uh, you know, mix and aggregate samples about every 1500 ton. And uh, they have to also take samples for physical properties. And one thing that has changed now recently in the last few years is that the contractor will generate their own random numbers. We used to do that, but we don't do that anymore. They generate their own random numbers and they decide when they're going to go take a test. We have to know when they're going to take it. They have to tell us or they have to give us a copy of that. And and that's so um, now as far as we're concerned, uh, we're, we're going to we're in the business for as we talked about earlier is that we're in the business of verifying this 
making sure that uh, assuring us that that the quality is being done right. So we have to take some tests too, and it's a lesser amount than the contractor, but we have to do it to verify that everything is working good. And so we have to get a separate test. A QA and a QC lab have to get separate tests. It cannot be a split. Now we talked about the split earlier, but that was just for putting, setting aside and using, not using it, just setting it aside in case there's some dispute. This, the test that we go out to get, we have, we generate our own random numbers, the QA people, and we actually, um, we have a kind of an increased frequency for the first few tests, and, and then we can go down to once a day, but they have to be, uh, I have to stre stress that it's separate, it's not a split. So, it, it, it uh, so sometimes it, what happens is that the, the QA and the QC kind of go out together and get their tests right side by side. That's really kind of a split. So so the, the, the asphalt inspector should get their own random numbers and they should go out whenever it says that they can go out to get them. It might be an hour, two hours after or an hour or so, whatever, uh, between, between when the contractor took it and when they did. So uh, that's what keeps it all random, and that's what keeps it. Uh, that that's a very important thing uh, to know is that it's everything has to be separate. And so, um, contractor, while they're taking these tests, they have to keep you know they have to write everything, they have to document everything, they have to maintain control charts, and and that's uh, something that and we have they have to be available to us as inspectors to to uh, to look at. And so one of the things inspectors should do is verify that these all the tests are being done, of course, and verify that control charts are accessible. They have to be accept accessible to the anyone that walks into the QC lab. Uh, be able to look this up. It's easier when you get a bunch of tests going, it's easier to uh, see what's going on with a, with what they call a chart like this. And there's several of these charts. Not There's one here for air voids, but there's seven or eight more types. There's all the sieves have them. And then all of the like physical property things and all the mix, some of the mixed things. So uh, it, it's better if you have a chart because then you can see some trends going on. Now, that's the whole idea behind it. If you see some trends that aren't working very well, uh, communication, is number one, you know, you want to make sure that you're, you're talking to everybody in engineer district materials lab. And of course, the contractor, you know, why are these tr things trending uh, out or trending towards the limits? So, uh, so if so between the, the two two labs, if the asphalt inspectors QA results are within tolerance, the contractors results are accepted. And that's how a QC QA operation works is the contractor's numbers can be used as acceptance as long as the the verifications are within tolerance. And so what, what happens if something doesn't work out? You know, what's the protocol uh, for for that? And that's in the quality in this field sampling and testing manual, the procedures for that. So I recommend uh, you know, read all over all these things, especially section 430 of the of the testing manual, because it, it read it you're going to use every bit of it. And the same thing with the specifications. And, and so there are two different things that can happen out there. The QA and the QC can go out of tolerance or the QC testing itself is not in the limits. And so there's a kind of a couple of different things, but these sort of lead to the same thing. And, and so if the tests are out of tolerance, if your QA test and QC tests are out of tolerance as per the tables that are in the testing manual, then what normally happens here is, is we have to, contractor has to resample, but when they resample, this is where the materials district lab comes into play. They get a three-way split. Now, now we're talking about a split of aggregate, not a separate sample. We're talking about a three-way split between all the parties and then that gets run, and then we just we determine what the discrepancy is, um, and, and then we move forward from there. So we we're trying to do is troubleshoot this. 
and 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 it's it's best to try to do all this as fast and as efficient as we can uh because we don't want to let the problems get away from us the, these plants put out a lot of tons and so we want to make sure we get get stuff straightened out uh fast you know and, and get get things back rolling normally and so uh now we're kind of getting into more of the contractor part of it you know if there's their tests maybe start to go out or something so they have to adhere to these single tests and tar and, and moving averages. So a single test is basically what it says. It's, it's, it's just a single test. And it has a wider limit than a, as you can see, than a moving average limit. A moving average limit target value is, 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 is a little bit different. It's, it's, it's determined using the last four recent single test results. And it has a narrower limit. And this is the one that we really want to watch out there is the is the moving average one. And uh, so here's just a typical, uh, as we had earlier, the uh, the air voids kind of blew up here a little bit. The, the red marks here are actually the single test limits, and they are wider, as you can see. Whereas the moving average, once the job gets going and you get a lot of tests, this is the one you want to watch. Uh, so, and that has a narrower limit. By the way, this one here is much easier, uh, much the moving tests when they start to trend out, they're much harder or more difficult to to move back the other way. Uh, so you don't really want to wait for those to get out because you might have two or three tests after that that uh, tried to get out of, you know, into a better range. So you want to kind of be more proactive with these moving average ones. So if a single test exceeds the limits, the contractor shall immediately take corrective action. Once you got your test result, they got their test results of this out, then they're going to want to re do some type of correct corrective action. And then they want to, you know, sample and 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 take another test uh, to see how that turned out. And if that passes, that's great. And, and then we can get back going. Now that particular test they use to do the um, correction, that cannot be used, that has to be set aside now uh, because it can't be used in the moving averages. Uh, it's it's going to be, that's basically just for correction. And so as as an inspector then, we need to be notifying the engineer that the, this stuff is out, you know, and the, and the district materials lab, and then uh, make sure we document the, what corrective action the contractor took and, and keep monitoring things and moving forward. And hopefully things will, will work out there. Uh, if moving averages go out, it's, it's pretty much the same thing. However, you don't really want to wait for them to go out. In other words, uh, this one here says trends toward. Uh, so you want to kind of be more proactive, as I said earlier, in, in trying to fix those. And so one of the things during the project that the contractor is required to do is is take readings of the totalizers that we that we talked about earlier in calibrating um, as the job is going through. So every time they take a, a, a an aggregate test, the QC test, they're required to go in and, and get these readings off the and, and, and in our, our presence. Uh, the readings off the totalizer. These are all in, and, and over to this computer here, these are all in tons. This is a tons per whatever time it was between the last reading and this one. And this all has to be entered onto a form called the asphalt content virgin aggregate determination. So, so really what this is all about is at the, at the, at the end of the day, we're going to know, want to know how much binder we used in the mix. That's going to come from our tank sticks at the end of the, beginning at the end of the day, we're going to figure out how much asphalt binder was used. But we also are really concerned about variability during the day. If we want 6%, for instance, in the mix, we don't want it to be varying at five and a half and six and a half all of all day long. We want it to be pretty, pretty, we want to be hitting, you know, six or whatever it is, or five or whatever it, it, the target is pretty close to that. And so that's what this form does. This, this, there's the form here that we're talking about. And this one, every time you do a, a test, uh, and this is the asphalt content and virgin aggregate determination. So every time the QC takes a test, we have to get readings and off this. And so these, these three readings, one of them, the top one here is the aggregate, and then the middle one is the wrap 
aggregate minus the binder that's in it. And then the bottom one here is the, actually the, the, the tons of asphalt that's been used. And so all this gets entered on this form. And then they could just a simple formula to figure out what is the actual, uh, how much binder are we actually getting in it? And you can see this is actually uh, running pretty close here for this particular project. And so all these numbers are put in here. And, and so uh, there's, if this varies too much, there's actually a penalty uh, that has to be given. So contractors motivated to keep this very uniform. And that's why we, they calibrate the plant is to make sure all this is, you know, doing well. So, um, so one of the, one of the things then also is compaction, as, as Brian talked about. Um, at the end of the day, uh, Brian is is going to go out, for instance, and or or the paving inspector and, and get mark out cores, and and then the contractor is going to core them in our presence, and then we're going to take uh, we're going to take uh, possession of them and bring them into the lab, and then we're going to. There's going to be a little bit more processing, but then finally we're going to we're going to test them uh, for the bulk specific gravities of these. And then what we do is we take that information. For instance, uh, this one has a station 344. Uh, then you enter that in here. I just entered one here on this form, and this is actually done with the paving workbook. And you then it can it figures out and uh, what your density is. Now the only re the bulk itself isn't going to do it for us. So we have to have the uh, rice test or the maximum sp uh, theoretical density average for the day. There might be three or four of these done, and they're all averaged together. And this is uh, usually the contractor's number. Uh, and I say usually because uh, if our tests. Uh, indicated that the quality control uh, tests that the contractor did were intolerance, then yes, we will use the contractor's numbers there. And and that's what is used to compare the bulks. And then here you, you will get a density. So, so um, I, I, one of the things also that we want to, to make sure that we get samples of are the, the binder itself that come in these trucks uh, in the transports. And we have to do that. They have to do that in our presence. We have to make sure they're labeled and manifests are put on. And uh, we want to take possession of them and then we send them into uh, Central Lab for testing. So some other duties and more of a visual thing is, is uh, occasionally you might, uh, you want to make sure that, you know, it doesn't, if you want to go into the QC lab and, and watch them do some tests, that's that's great, you know. And, and watch for evidence of, of blue or dark smoke. So smoke that means the mix is getting too hot and starting to burn off the some of the binder, damaging the binder. Some uh, you want to make you want to develop a good mental picture of what good proper mix looks like, so that you can see, make sure that everything is looking good, and 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 uh, want to be checking the temperatures of the of the material. And, and visually inspect the components of the plant and, and periodically check the scales uh, for accuracy in the labs and things like that. And visually uh, expects, you know, uh, inspect the, the stockpiles for segregation. Uh, inspection diaries, we want to make sure that uh, is, uh, an asphalt plant inspector is, is an inspector too, a tester inspector is an inspector, just like any other inspection. And we do inspection diaries for all our other things. And so it, it's always good to do an inspection diary. And I only have a token amount of things down here. It's something you want to talk to the uh, engineer about what they really want. It's 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 when you're finally in these jobs or if you're trying to figure out what happened one day, it, it really helps to have an inspection diary. Uh, now, Laura talked about all the paving workbook forms and things and and and. and uh, they all all that that workbook can really do a lot of things as far as calculations and 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 it's amazing the amount of things it can calculate and it calculates the whole cutoff report for us and as long as we put the inputs in uh, every once in a while just for my own good I I I I like to just run through one of these myself and kind of break it apart and kind of do it by hand 
And it, it kind of is good that way because if something goes wrong, and sometimes it does, not very often, but sometimes things don't work out. And uh, you kind of wonder why. So I just want to go through one real quick. Basically what we get, this is kind of the heart of the one of the uh, things that happen out there as far as the, the, the binder's concerned. It tells you two things, quantity of binder that you use during the day, and it also tells you the percent of binder in the mix that was put in. Now we have a, a, a range. If we started with, if we want 5% in the mix, we want to end up with that. Uh, and, and so we want to we want to do this cutoff and find out those two things. And so there, there's, I kind of broke it down in segments here, and it's just going to kind of talk about each one a little bit. <clears throat> so the first one here is the beginning of the day. The contractor is going to want to, as I mentioned earlier, stick the tank. And that's going to tell them how many hot gallons they have. Now, the plant, a lot of plants, they have several plants out there, or several tanks full of mix. And so they want to get readings from all of them. And this is actually the first part, uh, first section of the of the uh, of the cutoff report. And so they they enter all those hot gallons in there, and they know the temperature. So then they go to their pocketbook or our our pocketbook. We used to have to do this stuff by hand, but now this is all in the paving workbook. But anyway, you you put down your correction factor and bring it down to a volume of sixty degrees. So this all these are smaller than what is over here. And then from there, you want to go through it like we did for that example. You want to, you want to, you've got your, your reduced, your gallons at a standard temperature, and you're going to want to know the specific gravity of the manifest that was uh, of the, of the average of the day from the, yes, the day before. You want to put that in there. And then you're, what you're going to end up with is you're going to get a, a certain amount of, you're, you're going to end up with tons. So you've got a certain amount of tons for the beginning of the day. And as the job goes on, there's going to be many trucks coming into the plant and they're going to be given us, for every load, they're going to have a manifest like this. Now this one actually came out of the Canada. So there's some metric numbers here, but you get your shipping number, uh, your binder, the type of binder, your quantity. Now that can be converted down into a pounds figure. And then the specific gravity of the binder is all from this manifest. And that but that particular, this particular one, for instance, the 67373 is one of these that is on this cutoff report uh, right here. And so you get these all day. This is uh, for that day, there were several trucks came in. You want to add that all up, divide by 2000. All we're worrying about in the manifest part of this, doesn't matter what the temperature is, it's what pounds are there. Or, or tons. So in this case, during the day, that's how much the many tons came in. And and so there's two there's things happening during the day here. There's there's mix uh, adding to the tank or transports are filling the tanks up, but it's simultaneously being drained by the plant. And so we're keeping track of that. Um, the end of the day, we do the same thing as we did at the beginning. We stick the tank, the contractor sticks the tanks in, in our presence and go through the same thing again. We end up with a with a ton number here again. And so then we can, all that information we could take here now and we can add, we'll add, uh, we got bitumen in the story. So we got that much to start with. We added that much to it. This is what's left over. So we subtract that and we, we go through that calculation. So 211.24 uh, was used, uh, tons was used that day in the mix. And so then we can go into here now, the last portion here. Uh, we know from the the uh, tickets that there was, in this case, 42.10.74 of, of uh, actual mix put on the, uh, produced that day. And then we confer with the uh, asphalt plant or asphalt paving inspector uh, to find out how many tons of waste there was on the road. There may be some tons of waste on the, in, in, in the plant too. And so we add that to it because it was actually produced uh, during the project. So um, that all gets totaled. And then we can determine, we can figure out from that just by dividing this 211.24 by 
by the by the 4212, we can figure out how much a binder was actually used or percentage of the binder in a ton of mix. And and I believe this job that was 5% was the target. So they got pretty close here. So now we got to kind of figure out the waste though. Uh, we don't want to pay for that oil that's in the waste. And so there's just a calculation here to figure out how much waste we want, or actual binder that's in the waste. We want to subtract that from this 211.24. So this is what we actually pay the contractor. We're going to pay them this for this many tons at, a, at whatever the bid price was for the, for the oil. And so that's what you get out of a, a cutoff report. At the end of the day, they're going to also give us a what they're required to do in, in Section 154 is uh, give us a printout of every 15 or 20 minutes. I think it's 15 in the spec. I'm not sure why this is 20, but it is. Uh, everything that goes on during the day, uh, during that 10 minute time or 20 minute time period, all the weights, everything that's happening. So we're going to get a printout out of that every day and this is really uh and and this is a, you know another form out of the paving workbook of course and i just kind of highlight some of the numbers but uh, this is really where everything is put together and and you know you've got your aggregate material here and make sure that it doesn't go out of spec there's a penalty for that if there was uh and, and the the bituminous material whether it was uh you know the cutoff was right at the target or if it had any problems with variability and then the compaction numbers and things of that nature so that's 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 what that form is and then when it's all done everything is done for the day then you can actually enter all your equip or all your uh uh information from the uh paving workbook into the materials dropbox uh, excel version and then plant safety it's very very uh the plants are very uh they're noisy they're they're dirty they're loud i mean you know they're they're just a lot of things that you got to watch for and, and the danger of burns and the possibility of uh fire and explosion <laughs> presence of moving conveyors and and other machinery uh, unsafe conditions should be brought to the attention of the contractor for prompt correction and so the inspector should make sure that they're following the contractor's protocol as well as far as safety uh, when you're walking around these plants. You want to make sure you have all your gear on, protective gear on when you go out of the lab. So that's all I have. Uh, any any questions? Thanks, Kurt. I think we'll we'll hold up on questions so we can at least give 20 minutes to the UAS topic yes, here next. So yeah. no, you're you're good and really a good topic Kurt so thanks for all the information okay, um, thank you Brandon or Darren I'm not sure who's going first but uh I'll let you guys take it I'll go first here this is Darren from Devil's Lake There we go. Yeah, uh, Grand Forks and us uh, were teaming up on this one. So uh, I am from Devil's Lake, but uh, we figured this presentation would go a little better with what they have, were presenting today. So uh, I'm going to talk a, a little bit on gravel pits. Um, it's going to be kind of a brief overview of kind of the different pits. And then I'm going to focus on uh, one pit that we had last year. And it, we've actually used it a couple times in what we did. So kind of go through, discuss the uh, the different pit types that we have in the spec book. Uh, then I'll give you an example of a department option pit that we've been using. And then some uh, lesson learned, lessons we learned from it. So first pit is a uh, most commonly used, it's privately owned. Uh, it's one the uh, contractor either owns himself or he leases from a private owner. Um, contractors in charge of getting their own agreements, their own COAs, and essentially all we need to do at the end is get a pit release from them. So we kind of 
stay out of all the negotiations and the agreements and just leave that up between the contractor and the landowner. Uh, the next one we have is a department owned pits. Um, the state actually owns quite a bit of land around the state and some of them do have gravel pits on them. So the state either owns the surface or the gravel rights to the pit. Um, if a contractor is going to use one of these, you need to make sure that they're notifying the engineer and the gravel prospecting coordinator in writing that they're going to use it. And then the, the department will charge royalties for any aggregate taken out of the pit. So it's fairly easy there to keep track of it and just make sure they weigh everything. And so you have a record of everything that leaves the pit. And then there should be, a, before any work begins, should be an agreement of what the royalties are going to be. There we would either be in the proposal or in the spec book. If you read, the uh, department will come up with a reasonable uh, royalties. And then uh, since the state does own the land, generally the district materials coordinator will be the one to sign the pit release when they're all done and make sure everything's good to go. Our third pit is a department option pit. Um, if you don't know, the department has their own gravel prospecting crew. Um, they're in charge of going around the state and finding different gravel sources. And they will work with the landowner. They'll uh, do borings to find out, you know, what the gravel is, what all the conditions are like. They'll work out agreements with the, the landowner for any royalties and crop damage, anything like that. And they'll also get all the environmental clearances, so the COAs and that, and that'll all be done. And then any close proximity projects to that area, they'll put in the proposal of projects when they're bid, so the contractor will know they're there. And if you look in the proposal of these projects, you, know, you should see an agreement and it'll lay out any requirements to be done in that pit, uh, how royalties are supposed to be paid and that. Uh, one tricky thing with department option pits is royalties are paid for all material processed. So it's not only just the material hauled out, but anything that's left in the pit, um, any waste material, all of that needs to be paid out as royalties to the landowner. So that's where the tricky part comes in is measuring all this material. And the uh, spec book calls out the department as the one that's in charge of measuring it and coming up with the quantity. So if a contractor is going to use these pits, uh, they're supposed to notify the engineer and the gravel prospecting coordinator. And then also, before moving in, it doesn't say it anywhere, but you should make an agreement with the contractor on how the material be measured on whether we're going to go in there with a GPS or a drone or however we're going to measure it, make an agreement so that everyone's on the same page before we start. On uh, here's just another slide of that. Um, decide how the material is going to be measured. If a drone is going to be planned to use, make sure the site can be flown to the drone. Uh, make sure there's no airports close by, power lines. You know, make sure it's it's going to work out to fly it with a drone. And then just work with the contractor to make out a plan. Uh, and here's the pit I was going to talk about. Um, it's owner is a Betty Mertz. And uh, department optioned it for uh, a few different projects. Project's located roughly four miles south and three miles west of the junction of Highway 3 and 200. Uh, we used this job or pit last year for a project on Highway 52 where we did some paving and built passing lanes. Uh, the prime contractor was Mayo Construction and the aggregate pressure was aggregate construction out of Minot. 
and the materials that were made in there were class five and super pave FA 45. So we'd actually used this pit in 2021 also and had a few issues with things that went on. So I made sure when we were going back in there that we made agreements with the contractor before anything started so that we didn't wouldn't have those issues. Uh, so the agreement we made is that we would fly the pit before any crushing begins so that we knew exactly what was there and had record of that. Uh, we'd, make, we'd weigh any material that was hauled out, so any of the class five, the asphalt, we'd weigh it and make sure we knew how much was hauled out. And then we also told them to leave all material in piles so that when we we're done, we could measure them. And then we'd fly the pit when all hauling was done and then add the two measurements together to find out the, the royalties. So our initial flight we did was a May 24th. Um, you can see a little screenshot of that, what the pit looked like. So there were a few piles there, some leftover material from the year before. So we measured that because they were going to use it because that material had already, uh, they'd already paid royalties on. So we didn't want them to pay royalties on it again. Um, then uh, our plan we had was just to fly it at the end, but it came, turned out the contractor that was crushing needed more room and they were running out of room to put everything in piles. So we had to go up multiple times and fly different waste piles so that they could push them down back down in the hole and keep the space they needed. So here's a couple more times we flew, measured some piles and they pushed it down. Uh, here's a couple more, had to go out. And this is one I'll talk on a, in a little bit, but uh, the contractor had told us they hadn't pushed any of this uh, center pile down. <clears throat> and while we had flown it five days apart, and you can easily see here that this south half of this natural finds pile is gone from five days previous. So we had those records and could easily call them out and say, no, you pushed part of that pile down in the hole. And then here's our final flight. Uh, November 4th, we flew it. Um, you can see all our measurements there. We use PIX 40 to measure them to get all the uh, the final quantities that were left there. And then we put everything in just into a spreadsheet, labeled all of our flights, all the, the quantities, and then put them in so we could send it to the contractor, show them what they owed for uh, royalties. Uh, some lessons we learned uh, is you can never have too much information. Um, the more flights, the better. Uh, it wouldn't hurt if you have time, you know, with the drone, it's so easy to go out. You could fly it every week if you wanted to. And you wouldn't necessarily have to process the information, but just you would have it. But the more information you can get, the easier it is to figure out quantities and what happened in that pit. And then also make sure the contractor knows you can only fly when the weather allows it. Uh, the crusher was really good at telling us the day they needed to push a material or push a pile down and wanted it flown like that minute. And while there was some days that was foggy or rainy or windy and we couldn't get there for a few days to fly it just because the weather wouldn't allow our drone to fly. So make sure the contractor knows to give you a heads up so that you can plan out with the weather because you can't just show up anytime and fly with these drones. You need to have the right conditions. And I guess that's all I have. Uh, kind of get us back on schedule here. So. I think I'll turn it back over to Brandon.
All right. Um, I guess I was asked to just kind of talk about the the data we're collecting and and what we can do with it, and all of that kind of re relates back to quality. Um, we can we can fly as much as we want, but if you know if we're not doing a good job collecting the data, you get garbage out. So I just wanted to show some of the did three test flights and these were actually my first two flights with our new drone just to kind of show how to do a flight and how things like ground control will affect your output and what you can do with it. Did the first flight with the, the Mavic 2 Pro, which would be pretty similar to the Zoom, 168 feet above ground level for a, a half inch per pixel ground sampling distance. With the older drone, it took over 28 minutes. Brandon, like, oh, if, if you're sharing your screen, we're not seeing it. it says it's sharing. Try this again. There, now we, now we can see it. Thanks. All right. So the. Uh, and of course, all those images took about five and a half hours to process. I did this one without ground control points just to show um, some of the caveats of of using that drone without ground control. And then uh, as a test with our brand new drone, um, I just wanted to fly it a couple of different ways just to just to well to test the RTK capability of it as well as just compare. So the first one I flew at 328 feet above ground level just because that's what DJI wanted me to default to. I like using defaults, so I decided to see what that would give me. Um, that claimed it was gonna give me a, a one inch per pixel ground sampling distance. I flew 20 acres in about three, three and a quarter minutes, 152 images only took an hour and a half to process. Um, I processed it twice, once with and once without ground control, just to compare RTK with and without ground control. And then just for more of a direct comparison, I flew with the Mavic 3 at the similar settings to the Mavic 2. Um, 495 images, but the drone has a much better camera much better shutter, was able to fly a lot faster. It only took seven and a half minutes to survey 20 acres, and then I processed that with, with ground control. So here's a Mavic 2 flight. Um, we use PIX40 capture to control the drone and, and overlap of photos. Um, there was a time when I thought this, you know, it's pretty good imagery that you collect. Um, you could zoom in and, and see, you know, measure crack width, but that's the type of picture the Mavic 2 collected at 168 feet. Um, you can see the Mavic 2 is kind of a preliminary point cloud after initial processing. Anything that was black, it really wasn't able to collect data, had a lot of trouble with roofs of the buildings and, and the snow medians wasn't able to do much with that. Um, kind of a densified point cloud. This is um, part of after processing what it came up with for the surface for the point cloud. One of the issues of using non-RTK drones without point cloud, you can see on the right side of this picture, there is a heck of an arc in there. And while some surfaces may have vertical relief, our yard doesn't. There is a there is a nice uh, skew in our surface here, which I'll get back to again later. So I flew the same area with the Mavic 3 um, using DJI's built-in software. This is the flight path that chose to fly it at that elevation. Um, this is a picture from the Mavic 3 at 328 feet. You can see the you know, the imagery is much better, much more clear. With photogrammetry, the clearer the picture, the more definition, the more 
point matches it can make, the better point cloud you're going to get. Um, just kind of a direct comparison, the image from the Mavic 2 Pro compared to the Mavic 3, compared at, at the 158 feet compared to the Mavic 3 at 328. You can just, you can see the definition difference over, and you can see the ribbing in the vehicle on the Mavic 3. Again, the more definition, the better the surface reproduction. So here's the image from the Mavic 3 um, point cloud. Still some you know, dark areas where it wasn't able to do much, but they're pretty, you know, they're pretty sporadic. Overall, the image is very complete. And if you look at it from the side, you can see that it looks, you know, pretty flat, like the Red River Valley should look. Um, you can see in the back corner there, um, kind of the edge of the imagery got a little wonky. Got just kind of a testament to when you're when you're flying an area, make sure you're flying past the extents you want so that you can trim off the edges and anything like that would be trimmed out versus having part of your surface be compromised. So to get to those points, um, you go just go into PIX4D, create your project after you flow in your project. You go into PIX4D, create your project, point PIX4D to your imagery. It'll pull up the imagery. Um, this was RTK imagery, so it shows the accuracy being pretty tight there on the right. But basically, it just tells you it found the images and it was able to load the, the geospatial data out of the images. Um, you tell the computer what coordinate system you want to output it in. With uh, with PIX4D and with the way DJI collects data, it's just easier to use state plane coordinates, not county coordinates. So if you use state plane coordinates, everything goes smoother. So after you've pointed to the images, you pick your your output and everything we do is going to be a 3D map. Um, and then at this point, you can just tell it to process and it'll give you a it'll give you a, a surface. However, if you want ground control points, there's there's extra steps. Um, you would have, instead of telling it to process, you you'd tell it you'd go into the ground control manager. Point it to the CSV file of your of your surveyed ground control points and check shots. Just tell it they're you know YXE just like any other for you know MicroStation or TBC. It pulls in your your points and you know gives you your uh, coordinates and elevations. And at this point, you can only choose a basic editor. There's two ways to pick points in, in PIX4D. You can pick them in the basic editor or, or you can use the uh, Ray Cloud editor. But first you have to do Ray, the basic editor where you pick three points and two images each and then run the initial processing. And this is just, if, you, if you're surveying and using your state plane coordinate system, it will, you can click on a point and it will pick the images that it, believes should have that that ground control point in it and then you can click on it in two of them and then run your initial processing after you've initially processed which takes you know took about 20 minutes for this job with 160 pictures i believe something like that you can go back into the ray cloud editor go back into ground control manager and this time you can choose ray cloud editor and here now it's it's all these blue dots are the control points and the checkpoints that I shot around our yard. I was going to use four of them for ground control points and the other seven is just checkpoints. So I can click on the left on like point 101 and then on the right, it pulls up the images that point 101 are in. Um, that top point's got a yellow circle. That means that's one of the ones I used to process. I can scroll down. Um, zoom in and pick that point in in the rest of the images that it shows up in. And you can do that for all of your ground control points. You don't have to go searching for them in all of your photos. 
And of course, just kind of zoomed in here, it's highly pixelated because I'm zoomed in that far, but you can see that even without picking, you know, it's it's more or less found. The, the green X is where that picture currently has that point, your coordinate. And if you were to click on automatic marking, the, the yellow cross is where it would move that point to, or you can manually pick it. Um, so after you pick that in all of your points, on the lower left, you can see where you have your processing options for initial processing, point cloud, which you need for your surface, or the third step would be orthomosaic if you want to put it into microstation, reference it into microstation or something like that. Um, since you selected more ground control, you have to rerun the initial, select your other two and click go. And at that point, you get your outputs. Um, in PIX4D, you can just measure piles straight out of there pretty easily. And you can, but if you want to do incorporate your flight data with any ground survey you've done, you need to bring it into MicroStation or TBC. I prefer, I prefer TBC. But here it looks like a picture, but this is actually hundreds of thousands of colorized points. It's my point cloud from my flight. Um, just you literally just drag and drop it into your after you start your TBC job and, and have your coordinate system set up. You just drop it in and this is and it pops it out. Um, you can see some of my point data showing up on there as well. So what I did is I drew a boundary. You know. So I clipped off the edges. I drew a boundary of our district yard. To kind of just limit to the area I'm concerned with and created a surface out of that point cloud. And this is the Mavic 2 Pro surface. Um, no ground control. Horizontally, it looks real nice. Um, it is shifted a little bit. It's shifted, looks to me, by about eight feet. Again, there's no ground control. It's, I mean, that's going to be kind of expected. That's why I'm showing what can happen. It's, it looks good and it's real close, but not really close enough. Um, I know it's kind of small, but the elevations varied the, from the surface to my control points, varied anywhere as much by 811 to 832 ish feet over 11 points. Um, so that curve that you saw in my earlier slide amounted to basically a 21 foot warp in the surface. So this. I just kind of wanted to point, throw this out there to show that you need to use ground control or what you get just looks pretty. It's not very useful for measurements. Um, I did do an 80 acre borrow pit last year with my Mavic 2 Pro. I used 18 control points and I was able to get within point like 1% of the consultant survey on a quantity. So you can do good work using ground control. It just takes you know more effort and more preparation. <clears throat> to kind of show what we can do, what the newer drones will do, or any RTK drone to, for that matter. Um, no ground control. I just flew it with the Mavic 3 with RTK enabled. Again, the elevation was still off because it wasn't tied to the surf tied down properly, but it's consistent. You know, there's only a half a foot variance between the 11 points and their associated surface points. So that I mean it's that would be pretty useful for area measurements or you know most volume measurements like piles without any ground control. And if you add the ground control points, I was able to get my surface and that was the same data. All I did was pick four of those points, one in each corner as ground control. The surface varied from 500s high to 1500s low of the of the points, which over six points averaged out to about 300s, um, generating a surface with a, an average error or a mean error of 300s per point in a 20 acre survey in three minutes is is pretty impressive in my opinion. I was I was very happy with that. 
Um, as far as quality control, I shot 11 points. I, I wasn't, so when you're doing quality control, you would use the points you don't use to tie down your surface as ground control points. Um, there is a positional accuracy standard. It basically uses mean error and standard deviation and root mean squared calculation to get a to get a confidence level of the accuracy of your survey. Um, the bottom picture is well, it's the control point picks 4D because it's the picture I had, but it picks 4D will give you the 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 mean errors on a point. These ones are. You can see the theoretical error here is like 2000s, and that's because I, I used this as a ground control point and tied it to that point. So it should be close. But if I was to pick one of my other seven points that I didn't use, it would give me an error of a few hundredths, you know, a tenth, give me the average error. And then I could plug that into these formulas and get a and get a accuracy estimate for the survey. Um, one of the things I wanted to do with the new drone was compare two measurements of the surface. So I decided to compare the both of my flights with the Mavic 3 at the two different elevations. The, the lower flight, uh, the software chose to fly in an east-west direction, and the higher flight flew in a north-south direction. So they were, the images were completely different, different perspective on the on the objects when it was creating the ground. Um, I also only flew a single grid where it only flew at once. I didn't do a cross flight, which is what you would get, what you would need to do for better, better um, 3D modeling of things like buildings and trees and, and equipment. So over 20 acres, um, the, the difference between the two surfaces generated was only one tenth of a foot on on these two surfaces, um, and I thought that was really amazing, given the number of trees and buildings and 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 cars and equipment and people coming and going out of the lot. Um, but because we wouldn't normally fly when we're out in the field, you know, doing roads and ditches and borrow pits and things, we wouldn't normally be that worried about things that have a lot of vertical relief, like buildings and trees. I restricted my comparison to just this boundary area. It's kind of a, a flatter part of our, our yard. There's a CDL testing area, the road. We have some snow piles there. And where there wasn't a lot of vertical relief, the, the, the difference between the surfaces in this area was only 400 of a foot between the two flights that were generated at different elements. So obviously the quality of the data is repeatable and and, you know, very accurate. Um, some takeaways, uh, non-RTK drone data, you saw the warp, it's going to need ground control points and you're going to want a lot of them to keep to, you know, as as the photos get away from each other and, and it's going to start to wander unless you keep having ground control point to tie it back down to where it belongs. The RTK drone data was really good relative to itself, even without GCPs, you know, there wasn't the warping problem, which would be. So if you were if you didn't want to set up ground control and you had an RTK drone and you just wanted area measurements or, you know. Or, you know, small volumes, they'd probably be fine without ground control, although you wouldn't be able to compare a future survey directly to it. Even one ground control point to tie it down would would solve that. And a ground control point can be anything. It doesn't, you know, I I use those seco targets for this because I had them. But you can use any point. You can uh, contractors will just spray paint on the ground and and number it. You can use a particular corner of a slab or a particular, you know, corner of an ADA panel. Anything that you can definitely pick out of a picture can be a ground control point. Um, any surface to surface comparison would absolutely require ground control points. Um, if, you, if you're not tying them down. The air of the of the drone, the surfaces will be all over the place. And then I guess I'm completely confident in the data that we're able to collect and you know, we got four more of these RTK drones coming to the di different districts. 
if we're going to have other the districts using the non-RTK drones for some survey quality stuff and using the ground control, I think we can get quality data. So I think what we should do is make sure that we determine what the QC standards for should look like for project and payment related drone surveys so that you know we're already using it. I've used it. Devil's Lake is using it. You know, we want to know that uh, everything's quality and acceptable. Um, this picture here is kind of a 3D point cloud of, of our district yard just to show that you can see the, the state mills got their snow piles from removing snow in the background. There's just, it's amazing data that gets collected 20 acres in three minutes. It's, it's just amazing. Um, I know I blew through this pretty quick and a lot of these pictures you probably weren't able to see very well on your screens. So I put everything on the U drive, um, which is where a lot of drone data goes from most of the districts and central office. Um, the positional accuracy document on how to calculate accuracy is there if you were interested. All my images are there. My TBC files are there if you wanted to play with the surfaces I generated and compare them. And then this PowerPoint's there if you wanted to look at anything closer. Um, I just really, the, the in particular, there's three images there from the, the drones at the different heights that I think it, it's mind blowing the detail you can see. And if you wanted to look at that, better it's it's there for you to look at but put it all there because i i don't feel like a, a presentation can do justice to the imagery and 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 the work that tbc does with the surfaces so you can you can take a closer look at it yourself that's all i have all right thanks brandon um i know we love went a little bit over our time and send out to our presenters when they got hours upon hours of stuff to present on trying to condense it down here, but uh, great job, Brandon and Darren and Kurt and Ryan. So thanks guys. I guess I'll turn it back over to you, Josh. Well, I appreciate it, everyone today. Brian, Kurt, Darren, Brandon it was good. Um, not seeing any questions. I guess they can ask throughout the team's chat if they want. But that'll wrap it up for our inspection training for the year or for the, this month. I thank all the presenters over the last four sessions. And that's all I got. Thank you, Josh.